divisional playoff series between the Cleveland Indians and the New York Yankees has been all about swings of momentum. In game one, the Tribe rocked David Cohn and jumped to a 5-0 lead. But then a playoff first, back to back to back home runs. And the Yankees came back to take the series lead. In game two, 21-year-old Jared Wright got the call for Cleveland and quickly fell behind 3-0. But then he gathered himself giving the Indians a chance to mount their own comeback, which was aided by Yankee misplays. Eventually, Matt Williams put the game out of reach, and the series was tied at a game apiece. Now it's on to Cleveland, where the Yankees turn to David Wells to silence the raucous crowd at the Jake, while the Indians counter with 15-game winner Charles Nagy. The pivotal game three is next. NBC Sports presents the American League Division Series. Tonight, it's Game 3. The New York Yankees versus the Cleveland Indians. A warm October night by Lake Erie. Game time temperature will be 80 degrees. The Yankees and Indians arrive after splitting two in the Bronx, and now it becomes a best two out of three series, in effect, for an opportunity to advance to the league championship series. These are the two teams that represented the American League in the last two World Series, the Indians in 95 and the Yankees in 96. Hi again, everybody. Bob Costas with Joe Morgan and Mr. Baseball, Bob Euchre. Yuki had a chance to spend some time with your old Milwaukee Brave teammate, Joe Torrey, and the subject was pitching. Yeah, and a very relaxed Joe Torre, I might add, too, Bob. Yeah, the subject was pitching, and the main man for the New York Yankees, David Cohn. Joe Torre told us that David Cohn would not pitch in this series. He's still bothered by a sore right shoulder. We may see David Cohn in the league championship series if indeed the Yankees do go that far. Tonight for New York, it's left-hander David Wells who struggled in the month of August. Last three times out, he's been solid. 16 and 10 this year, eight and three lifetime against the Indians. And as you see, Cleveland's answer is Charles Nagy, a good pitcher, no question about that, but not against the Yankees usually. Well, you're right. He's one of the best starting pitchers in the American League, but he has not had any success against the Yankees. He's six and eight lifetime, 0 and two this year. If he expects to reverse that trend, he will have to keep his sinker ball down and change speeds on these Yankee sluggers. And the tip-off will come very early in this ball game. If he's getting a lot of ground balls, he's okay. But if the Bombers start getting the ball in the air, it could be another short evening for Charles Nagy against the Yankees. So it's Wells and Nagy. We're just about set to get things underway. Hope the paint dries in time. Game three lineups coming up. are watching the 1997 Major League Baseball playoffs on NBC Sports. Capacity crowd is a given at the Cape, regular season or postseason. We're told that Charles Nagy is still in the clubhouse, so we'll have a bit of a delay before the Indians take the field and the first pitch is thrown. This is a team that only two years ago, Joe, not only was the best in the American League, but you'd have to say, even though they lost the World Series to the Braves, they had one of the best single seasons in the modern history of baseball. 100 victories and 44 defeats in the strike-shortened season. This year, 86 victories was all they could manage, but that was good enough in the weak American League Central. And it's really evidence of the nature of modern baseball. Kenny Lofton gone, Albert Bell gone, a lot of changes that in the past wouldn't happen to a team that should have had a four or five year run of dominance based on the quality of their roster. Well, Bob Housen said something to me a long time ago. He said, you will not see dynasties anymore simply because each team will not be able to keep all their free agents. They will have to make trades depending on the amount of money they make. So you're going to expect changes each and every year, but you have to give the Indians credit. Even though they won all those games last year and didn't win the World Series, they came back this year and they have another shot. Here's Joe Torre's batting order to face Charles Nagy. Tim Raines is in left. Chad Curtis is on the bench tonight. 
Martinez with those 44 home runs, the most by a Yankee first baseman since Lou Gehrig in 1936. Cecil Fielder hits Nagy well, so Curtis rides the pine, at least at the start of the game. And Torrey doesn't want to go away from Tim Raines at all. He's been riding him late in the regular season and into the postseason as he did last year. There you see Charles Nagy, excellent sinker. That is his pitch. But he has a good curveball to change. But he has to have control of his sinker ball to get the ground ball and to be able to move his change up the round. And the defense there on the left side, excellent defense for their Cleveland Indians. Vizquel and Williams, two of the best. Vizquel, four gold gloves. Matt Williams, three, all coming in the National League. Kevin Seitzer is in at first base for Jim Tomey. Tomey does not hit David Wells. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But right now, while we have a chance, let's bring in Jim Gray. Jim? All right. Thank you very much, Bob. Well, as you guys were just talking about, Mike Hargrove told us before the game how at ease his team is, almost how relieved he is. He doesn't have the Albert Bell situation to worry about. He said there was a great shadow always following his team nationally because of Albert Bell and that presence in the locker room. He says now with David Justice and Marquise Grissom, everybody's able to relax. He really likes the way and the complexion that his team has been going, and he likes the feeling in the clubhouse, feels that they're a very confident group coming into the game tonight. Bob? There's Hargrove talking with plate umpire Ken Kaiser. Some of the changes just since the 1996 postseason. Bell and Lofton gone. Kent, Vizcaino, and Tavera is part of the deal that brought Matt Williams here from San Francisco. And these are the additions, Grissom and Justice, mentioned by Jim Gray, Borders, Fernandez, the starting second baseman these days, Mike Jackson, who was their closer for a while, but Jose Mesa has taken that role back, and Bip Roberts, their leadoff man tonight. And all of those guys have played a key role in their success this year, all the new players. Tim Raines hit 321 in limited duty with four home runs. Two for nine through the first two games of this series. A call strike from Ken Kaiser, and Kaiser is an important component in tonight's game. Both these pitchers like to work the corners and test just how far those corners will extend. Kaiser's strike zone could be important. There's the rest of the crew. Dave Phillips is the crew chief working second base. One and one. in talking with Joe Torrey before the game tonight and and how much he talked about Tim Raines and despite the fact that he's two for nine in the series he said Tim Raines is his Gomez. Of course one of those two was the first of the three mm -hmm. consecutive home runs that started the comeback in game one. Well they should erase the batter's box because most hitters do not use it anymore anyway. Two and two. Nice change of pace that time by Charles Nagy. He'll change off the fastball and the curveball. He throws two or three different styles of curveball, but he'll change off both. That is 2-2 two -two pitch. Reigns lays off the breaking ball, full count. One of the reasons that Tim Raines stands so deep in the batter's box, he's not real quick on the pitches inside. So if you get a little deeper, it gives you just a little longer to get to the ball. It gives you a little more time to handle that inside fastball. He gets a little piece of that fastball and stays alive. It also got a little piece of Sandy Alomar. The second time in this series that we've seen Alomar get nailed. He got hit on the uh, on the back of the fingers on his gloved hand over in the uh, the series in New York. This time that ball looked like it got him around the thumb, down around the bottom of his thumb on the gloved hand again. Got a lot of sting in there. They really hurt. No matter how sophisticated the protective equipment becomes, and we've seen many innovations for the catchers, you can't take all the danger out of it. And he misses with a 3-2 pitch, reigns aboard with a walk. Not the threat to run that he once was. There was a stretch in the early 80s where he led the National League in steals four consecutive years with the Expos. 
with a high of 90 swipes in 1983. He stole just eight in 13 attempts this year. And Bob, if you're looking for a key for the Cleveland Indians, not a good sign here from Nagy because not one of the pitches were down in the dirt or low. All of his fastballs, even the ones he fouled, were up in the strike zone, and the last pitch, ball four, was up and out of the strike zone. Not where Nagy has to pitch in order to be successful. He has to get the ball down. Up comes Jeter, who hit 10 homers during the regular season, but has two in this series. Four for nine overall against Cleveland in the first two games. Looks to bunt. The pitch comes up and in, and he pushes it foul. This is Joe Torre from last year. Joe Torre came over last year, and he played maybe a National League style of baseball. He would bunt. He would hit and run. He would use. He was a lot more aggressive than a lot of other American League managers had been the previous years. You see right here, he will bunt with Jeter, and then he may put a hit and run on. For a guy hitting near the top of the order, Jeter strikes out a lot, 125 times. Pitch out, nothing on. Tim Raines is on his own, so if he wants to steal the base, he, he can always take off. He has a green light. one pitch bounce back to Nagy he throws it wildly into center field and here goes Reigns on his way to third the Yankees have runners at the corners with nobody out on what could have been a double play ball you always make sure of one everyone will tell you make sure of one and watch what Nagy does he doesn't pick up the shortstop he just grabs the ball turns and fires look at that and the ball's running away from this scale luckily Biff Roberts was back there he tried to block it but watch this ball run away from him. He throws his sidearm, and you can see it's tailing away. You're supposed to take time, set yourself, and make one good throw because the first out is always the most important. Fernandez wasn't even close to that ball, Joe. The closest guy coming along the other side was Reigns, and that's who, that's who Nagy may have picked up because he was that close to the bag. In a jam of his own making, as a result of a walk in his own throwing error here in the first, Strike one to O'Neill. And that's the first pitch this entire ball game that he has gotten down around the knees and below. Well, if there aren't a lot of grass stains on the ball, then Nagy is in trouble. He has to throw ground balls. The 0 1. And he gets ahead of Paul O'Neill. As Joe mentioned, Nagy was 15 and 11 for the year, his ERA a bit over four. But against the Yankees, 0 and 2, with an earned run average of 18 in three 1997 starts. He's working on six days rest. He was hit hard the last day of the regular season last Sunday in Minnesota, and generally he doesn't like to pitch on such long rest. And One and two. And the reason he doesn't like this pitch on long days rest because he feels stronger and sinker ball pitchers have more success when their arm is a little tired the ball sinks a little bit more and as we mentioned he's maybe overthrowing the sinker so far in this ball game because all the sinkers and fastballs he's thrown have been up on one and two misses inside he just he just doesn't look like he has that kind of velocity either tonight Joe here early and it's it's the opening inning and and uh, he may pick up. Here's that last pitch. It's got a little bit of a tail on it. You can see the delivery from Nagy. It's got a little bit of a tail trying to get it to come back to the inside part of the plate, but the pitch was still upstairs. Peter back easily. Jose Cardinal is the coach at first. Willie Randolph on the lines at third. Now was in the whirlpool before the game. There's Willie. He was flattened by Jim Tomey in New York when Tomey wheeled to chase an errant pickoff throw and steamrolled him. That'll make the seats foul. Yeah, but Cardinal told me, he said, you see who got the best of that deal. Tomey can't answer the bail today, and I'll be out there at first base. <laughs> you know, it's really something. There's Jim Tomey. 
who has numbers that will place him somewhere in the top 10 in the MVP voting. 40 homers, better than 100 RBIs, but he has never hit Wells. Two for 14 lifetime, didn't start on any of the occasions Wells pitched against the Indians during the regular season, and is on the bench tonight. And the count goes full to O'Neill. I think the point needs to be made about that Comey's lack of success against David Wells, as you see his numbers this year. 40 home runs, 102 RBIs, those are the big numbers. But he also walked 120 times. But I'll make a point about that later because I think it needs to be revisited. And the count holds at three and two. Well, the point is 14 at bats is not enough to have a pattern against the pitcher. You have to have at least 20 at bats. In the first couple of times you face each other, each one of you is trying to find a weakness. And once you settle in, then you know whether you can hit him. He struck out three times in those 14 at bats. Not a lot. 14 at bats is really not enough to determine whether you can handle a pitcher or not. There goes Jeter on this 3-2 pitch, and it's ripped through the hole. The Yankees take the lead. Reigns comes across. Jeter to third. The only consolation here for Cleveland is that first inning leads haven't meant anything in this series. But not a promising start for Nagy. Here's that last pitch to Paul O'Neill. Again, it's a fastball up. Watch this pitch. It's about belt high, and O'Neill jumps all over it, rams it in the right field for a base hit. And remember, the Yankees in game two had a 3-0 lead after one inning. Indians jumped all over David Cohn for a 5-0 lead that didn't hold up in game one. Mm -hmm. Now Bernie Williams. Foul ball strike one. Williams is one for five in this series. Hit 328 as you see for the year. and scored the game's first run. A ball and a strike to the Yankee center fielder, one of the most elegant players in baseball. Everything about him bespeaks class on the field and off. The way he carries himself, spoken he is. Well, I'll tell you, Nagy here in the opening inning just, just does not appear to have it. And again, we're only in the first, but some of these breaking balls that he's throwing are, are, are really not biters. I mean, they're really not spinning and, and really getting a lot of good break on them. Sharp break and the fastball, again, little movement and, and for the most part, pitching upstairs. 2-1 pitch to him gets the corner two and two. The Yankees got another center fielder like that, didn't they, years ago? Kind of elegant, nice guy. Joe DiMaggio. You're right. Here's the fastball. This one started off the plate and came back on the inside corner, which is a very good pitch for Charles Nagy. Tino Martinez in the on-deck circle. A run home, nobody out. Runners at first and third. Tapped in front of the plate. That's a fair ball. Alomar is on it. O'Neill advances to second. Jeter holds third. And Williams is retired at first. So far in this ballgame, the only success he's had is with the breaking ball. Even though that's a hanger, Williams gets the top of it and it stays out in fair territory. Good play there by Sandy Alomar Jr. He was on top of it. Take a look here. Good breaking ball away, even though it was up, but a nice play here by Alomar Jr. You see him grab that ball, Joe, before it got into foul territory. It was spinning foul. This ball gets right to the line, and Alomar picks it up very quickly. Took a token look at third. Nobody advancing from there, and then throws the Seitzer to retire William. That ball was spinning toward foul territory. Now with first base open, it's Martinez. Strike one to him. He has owned Nagy over the years, and especially this year. Four for six, 
1997 against Charles Nagy and three of those four hits for the distance. One and one. This guy, Tino Martinez, has one of the most level swings in all of baseball. He, is, he has a beautiful swing, but you have to change speeds on him. He can really handle the fastball, especially up and out over the plate. Maggie again behind on the count. Tino Martinez having what could have been an MVP year, but for the presence of Ken Griffey Jr. The reason that he can, he's, he's going after Martinez even though first base is open is because Cecil Field is the next hitter. And Cecil hits him very well. But considering what Martinez has done against him, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, especially now, behind on the count three and one, not to give Martinez anything to hit and take your chances that Cecil might hit it on the ground and you can get out of the inning. Well, he's been trying to hit the inside corner with that fastball. Swing and a miss at the breaking ball, and it's full again. That's the curveball that Charles Nagy is looking for right there. This is a real biter down low and inside, and Martinez with a big swing and cut over the top of it. You see the spin on that ball? This is a really sharp curveball down low and inside, and that's what he needs. Well, if you threw it 3-1, you might as well do it 3-2, too. too. Peter at third, O'Neill at second. And the bases are loaded for Cecil Fielder. Two walks, an error, and one hard hit ball. Paul O'Neill single through the right side. A run home, bases loaded, one out. Cecil Fielder, 10 grand slams, 333 lifetime with the bases loaded. 33 for his career against Nagy, including four for six this year. His first at bat of this series, out mm. off. And Big Daddy had a cut right there. That may be the last one he sees <laughs> yeah. in that area, Joe. Yeah. Man, this pitch here just watch Cecil Fielder. He gets right out there on it. Everything is there. He just got under it just a little bit. And when you're getting under a sinker, that tells you <laughs> you better change your pattern. Good pitch. Don't, under two. don't underestimate Charles Nagy. I mean, he's quality. He's got the good breaking stuff, the good sinker. I said earlier, only in the opening inning. Here's a good fastball. There's that sinker about knee high on the inside, quarter on fielder. Waste one, one and two. Mike Hargrove got a contract extension, which takes him through next year. A different kind of season for him. But he's gotten the Indians to this point, despite all kinds of changes. The one, two. wants his arm to get tired then he's he's on his way he says he feels he throws his sinker better when his arm is tired he's on his way to getting tired 33 here in the first inning good play by Alomar to prevent a wild pitch two and two and this is Sandy Alomar watch him shift out here now instead of just trying to backhand that ball he shifts out and then gets the glove down and and palms up grabs it good play by Alomar Infield looking for the double play, of course. Trying to get out of this top of the first with minimal damage. Struck him out. This out pitch fools Cecil on the change on the speed, not so much the break. The fastball away, which he almost didn't get back, and a perfect fastball on the inside corner. 0-2. Oh, he weighs one. 
comes in again. Good pitch. Now this pitch here, look at that. The speed fools him. He's a little bit out in front. It wasn't the break that got him. It was the speed because that ball was pretty much in the middle of the plate. Charlie Hayes now. There was a time not long ago where there would be no question about a healthy Wade Boggs being in the lineup against any right-handed pitcher. But that time has passed. There's Wade, still valuable off the bench. As he proved in last year's World Series with a big pinch hit walk. Well, Joe Torrey told us tonight that there was no question as to who had the better range at third. It's Charlie Hayes. And he said anything hit right at him, Boggs handles everything perfectly. This ball is hammered to center field. Well hit, but Grissom will track it down. And it could have been a whole lot worse for Charles Nagy. The Yankees score one and leave three, and the Indians are coming up. Here's the lineup for the home club. Dip Roberts at the top, 11-year veteran in his first postseason. And Sandy Alomar, who at one time this year, and I'm talking two, three months into the season, had a batting average over 370, winds up at 324. The big story is in the number two slot, Kevin Seitzer, a very capable veteran player. Still dangerous. But it's really something you, when you take a guy with 40 home runs out of the lineup. Oh, absolutely. And uh, no matter what you say about Kevin Seitzer, as you look at David Wells, to be good, he's got to have the fastball and curve, which he does have. Problems for David Wells, every once in a while, he gets a little lackadaisical and takes takes something off. It, it costs his fastball velocity, and, uh, and he tends to be wild. Now you see Charlie Hayes playing at third. In, in place of Wade Boggs. Hayes, uh, the better movement around the bag, and uh, and Joe Torre said that's going to be the story. But yeah, with Seitzer, Seitzer's a good veteran player, Bob, and a, a guy that I had a chance to watch for a few years in Milwaukee. But certainly, certainly no, uh, no Jim Tomey. Seitzer will be next. Strike one to Bip Roberts. One and one, David Wells is 34 years old. 6'4 and 225. Lifetime against Cleveland, he's eight and four. 16 and 10 for the season. That's a career high in victories for him. Gets ahead of Roberts, one and two. He had won 15 for Toronto in 1991, and he's always been a good postseason pitcher. He has a 3-0 postseason record with an ERA of 2.7. Hit to short, Jeter charges and takes care of Roberts. So here comes Seitzer. who began with Kansas City, then on to Milwaukee, had good years for each. In fact, as a rookie in 1987 with the Royals, he hit 323 and was the runner-up in the Rookie of the Year balloting to Mark McGuire. This year in a utility role, 268 for the Indians. It's the first one to the right side. Martinez will take it himself. who beat Jimmy Key, and they'll bring Randy Johnson back in game four tomorrow. Now Johnson has had no success at all against the Orioles, and they hit him hard in game one at the Kingdom, but nonetheless, if you've got Randy Johnson and he can pitch at all, you go with him. That game will be on ESPN, as you saw, tomorrow. it down to Charlie Hayes. He catches it on the fly. And Wells works a very quick bottom of the first. He leads it 1-0. NBC's
coverage of tonight's Division Series game is brought to you by Oldsmobile and your local Oldsmobile retailers. By the irresistible taste that makes you say, did somebody say McDonald's? By Visa, it's everywhere you want to be. And by Sun America, the retirement specialist. Overhead shots, courtesy of the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes out of Pompano Beach, Florida. At the controls, Captain Larry Chambers from Lighthouse Point, Florida. In the first inning, Charles Nagy threw 37 pitches. David Wells threw six. Strike one to Joe Girardi. He'll be followed by Ray Sanchez, and then back up to the top for Tim Raines. Sharply to second. Fernandez to his right, juggles it, but has time. Here's that last play. Fernandez with a bit of a bobble. Finally corrals it. Can't take too much time with Girardi, one of the better running catchers in baseball. Well, with Fernandez having made that last play, and Ray Sanchez, the Yankee second baseman, stepping in. And promptly smacking one to short, where the gold glover Omar Vizcarra takes care of it. Might be worth noting that both the Indians and the Yankees are said to be intensely interested in Chuck Knobloch of the Twins. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, he's one of the better players in the league, and both are not settled at second base. I mean, he would make a great addition to either ball club. Knobloch signed that big multi-year deal with, uh, with Minnesota, and everybody thought that's going to make him a twin for the rest of his life, but it appears that he wants to leave, that he wants to get out of Minnesota. The twin situation is unsettled. They don't know if they'll get a new ballpark or possibly sell to a group that would move it to Charlotte. There's been a lot of talk about that, uh, and especially the Charlotte move. Reigns walked on a 3-2 pitch and eventually scored in the first. different Charles Mackey here in the second. Bob, and it could have been, you know, his adrenaline was flowing. He was overthrowing the ball in the first inning. He's gotten two ground balls on good sinkers down, and he's keeping the ball down to range here. The Indian pitching coach, Mark Wiley, with his charts. Nagy is 6'3", 200 pounds, 30-year-old Connecticut native who pitched for a couple of years at UConn before turning pro. He's got this one. In contrast to the first, he takes care of the Yankees with great dispatch in their second turn at bat. Still 1-0 New York. During the 0-5 stretch, David Wells' problem was his front shoulder was staying up too high, and he couldn't get over the top to get on top of his breaking ball. See how it clears right there? Now he's able to get that breaking ball down in the strike zone. And we're watching for the remainder of the evening to see if he's able to get on top like he did the first inning here. Matt Williams, he has a history against Wells, and it's a good one. Five hits and seven trips, two of them home runs. Sometimes he'll come up there sitting on a dead breaking ball. I mean, he'll look breaking ball, breaking ball, breaking ball. Other times he'll change and, and go to a fastball. But he said, you, you can never pitch Matt Williams one way. After the first Cleveland hit, David Justice steps in. If you have to 
lose Albert Bell to free agency and Kenny Lofton in anticipation of being unable to sign him to fill in with David Justice to fill in with Grissom to swing a deal that brings you Matt Williams that shows that John Hart is not asleep at the switch Justice has one of the sweetest swings in all of baseball. He and Will Clark have always been that way, but Will's had some injuries lately. You have to throw the fastball in on him, preferably up and in. He's a very good fastball hitter. When you get the ball out over the plate, he will take it to left field. You've got to try to get him to chase the breaking ball off the plate. He won't do it very often, and that's why he hits 333. He knows how to hit, and he's able to go the other way off left-handed. different is still formidable the drop-off is in the pitching when you compare them to 1995 Hershiser who will pitch game four against Doc Gooden is still a presence but at 39 not what he once was and Jack McDowell went down in May and they haven't had him they thought he'd be the workhorse and maybe the staff ace John Smiley broke his arm just before postseason Sanchez can't get it in the center field Williams Wheels around second and winds up at third. Consecutive singles to start the Indian second. One of the underrated parts of Matt Williams' game is his base running. He's a good base runner. And this ball is hit up the middle. Wells gets the ball out over the plate. He doesn't get it in. Now watch where this pitch is. Out over the plate. And David Justice handles that ball very well. And as it gets past the infield, take a look at where this pitch is. See, right out over the plate. You've got to stay tight on him. Matt Williams at first base. Now watch, he gets a good jump on that ball, and he decides right away he's going to third. He never slows down, comes around to third base. Good took, hustle by Matt Williams. See him take that token look in center field to see where the ball was, Joe, and then lit out for third. And the crowd into this game now. Alomar. A little pop to the right side. Sanchez wants it. And Sandy looks skyward in disgust. There's the kind of fastball that Joe was talking about that that uh, he should have thrown to David Justice. This is a good fastball. I mean, he got it in tight on, on Alomar, and, uh, and he popped it up. Watch this. This is a good fastball from Wells. There it is inside. He and Alomar right on the fist. That little flare on the infield. Yep. Next time, Sandy. Turn around on that ball quickly. If you can get around on it quickly, it's a ball you can really hammer. He was just a little tardy on it. Tony Fernandez hit 286 for the year, but almost 400 from the right side. first Williams at third one out bottom of the second and the Indians trailing one nothing other thing about Fernandez he's not a very big guy he's always been lean I mean he's had range as a shortstop now a second baseman but every once in a while I mean if he sits on a pitch he can pop you well he hit 11 home runs just misses the inside corner fastball is running in on the hitter and Fernandez was able to lay off. Jeter hands 
Sean Sanchez. Watch this play. Jeter goes into the hole. He wants to get the ball to Sanchez quickly. But I think the ball tailed away. Now watch it. See, he handcuffs him. And Sanchez makes a good turn, and he is out at first base. Now watch this play. He handcuffs him. This is a great turn in second base there by Sanchez. And you'll see right there, he's in the air just as the ball. And Martinez doesn't argue very often. Right there, he's in the air. Very close play, but he's in the air. You see Zimmer's up yelling. The Yankees have a very good view of that because they're right there on the line. And everyone was upset. I'll tell you. The other thing, too, Joe, is the hustle of Tony Fernandez. I mean, he was really busting down the line and made it a close play. Greg Koss called him safe. You see Don Zimmer? That has to be one of the worst calls I've seen in my 49 years in baseball. If I've seen one call that bad, I've seen, oh, six, seven thousand. <laughs> Keith Grissom. Wells, 0-1 pitch coming. ball by him. Grissom hit 262 and stole 22. A few years ago, he stole 76 and 78 in consecutive seasons while with Montreal. A ball and two strikes. Mike Hargrove told us that, that Grissom doesn't have the speed of a Kenny Lofton, but overall, their overall play, throwing, hitting, hitting with power, he says Grissom has a little more power. He said, I really want to keep Grissom here. I like him. He's good for the club. Not as speedy as he once was, but he still plays an excellent center field. But he gets a great jump on the ball. Rolls the one-two pitch foul. before that chart picks up. In 1991, he stole 76. So they've gone progressively down. When I talked to him, he said now he picks his spots better. He doesn't just steal bases, you know, to steal for numbers. He says he only tries to steal bases when the team needs a run. Can you go progressively down? Maybe consistently down and progressively up. Something to ponder as Grissom lofts one to left. Coming in his range. We will now progress to the commercial. It's a tie game after two at the Jake. Series tied at one apiece. Game tied at one apiece. Cheater, O'Neill, and Williams in the Yankee third against Nagy. They check with Greg Koss, who says he did not go around. Jeter reached on Nagy's throwing error in the first. Here's the scouting report on Jeter, last year's American League Rookie of the Year. Eventually. Well, Jeter is one of those guys where he likes the ball Miller to play in. It doesn't mean he wants to pull it, but he can go the other way. And there you take a look at him. He handles all pitches well, but he goes the other way a lot of times. There have been a lot of runs scored in this series so far. We have no idea the direction this game might take, but it's possible that the turning point as we look back, we'll have come in the first inning. 
Cecil Fielder's at bat when Nagy was able to strike him out. He was a few pitches away from having this game get completely away from him. And now it's possible that he's approaching the groove. You. Yeah, he had a shaky first inning, Bob. And, and the call, the big curveball on Cecil Fielder to strike him out. Then he gets Charlie Hayes on a fly ball to center to pitch out of it. And the next inning, I mean, from, from then on, he started to settle in. You see the old Charles Nagy. But he starts the third with a walk. Let's take another look at that play in the first inning that got the Indians a run. Jeter's throw to second base, handcuffs Sanchez. Now, let's see if we can get a look at the play at first base. It's a very close play, there's no doubt about that, but the ball does beat him. And I have the advantage of an instant replay, but the Yankees do not. And you see they're all up in arms right away when they, he's called safe. They don't have a replay, they don't need one. And that was the second inning, of course. O'Neill singled home the Yankee run. Hits this ball well to center field, but Grissom goes back to the edge of the track to haul it in. Grissom, like all good center fielders, every time a ball is hit, I mean, from our vantage point or from the stands, the fans think this ball is really juiced. And O'Neill did hit that ball well. But the crack of the bat, Grissom back, and I mean, he was in cruise control all the way. Knew he had plenty of room to make the catch. Here's another angle. Easy play for Grissom on a ball well hit by Paul O'Neill. There's the defense right there. Marquise Grissom, Tony Fernandez, Matt Williams. Pretty good defense the Indians are throwing out there today. All gold glove winners. He won't make the acrobatic plays, scaling the wall and reaching into the customers to pull one back like Kenny Lofton. Nobody in baseball, with the possible exception of Ken Griffey Jr., can do that with Lofton. But Grissom will get to almost everything that's reachable by anybody. Almost. One out, one out, and Bernie Williams takes a strike. How would you evaluate Kaiser's strike zone so far? Well, I think he's doing a good job, to be perfectly honest with you. I don't think that he's giving one pitch more than another. Uh, a lot of times the guy will give you the low pitch and not the high pitch or vice versa. So far, he's been pretty consistent as far as up and down is concerned. And that's all you want. You know, anybody who's watched SportsCenter all year on ESPN has to be saying, hey, Bob and Joe, you got to throw you got to throw Jim Edmonds' name in there when you talk about acrobatic center fielders. So let's take care of that oversight. Yeah. What a year he had for the Angels. Making some plays you had to see several times before you convinced they weren't an optical illusion. One and two to Williams. Ken Griffey is such a great outfielder, sometimes we take him for granted. Remember the play he almost made in center field the other night? We just assumed he was going to make it. Although it would have been, you know, one of the great catches in history on the ball that Alomar hit the center field in the kingdom. So there are a lot of great center fielders in baseball today. away from first and diving back now ahead of Seitzer's tag. Jeter is another of the Yankees that's on his own as far as Joe Torre goes with stealing bases. And if he gets a lead, if he feels he can steal a base, he has no problem with it. He stole 23, although he was caught 12 times, so that's not a great percentage. But he's a guy who keeps the defense aware of the fact that he will run from time to time. And he's a young player. He's still learning to steal bases in the major league. There he goes. Williams lays off. Alomar throw, not in time. And as soon as we say that, he gets a great jump at first base. Watch, he's off right away. In fact, he left a little early. I knew he had a great jump. Good but. throw by Alomar may get him, though, Joe. That throw was high and to the second base side. A good throw may have nailed him. There's Jeter taking a look at the pitch. 
which is not what you want to do. If it's a straight steal, you don't care where the pitch is. You're just running to the bag. But he's in there. Now Nagy, who has walked three already, runs another full count. Well hit right field toward the corner. Diving for it is Ramirez to make a terrific catch. Manny Ramirez with a whale of a play. One of the things that Mike Hargrove talked about in this, with us today was the concentration of Ramirez has improved. I mean, you see he ends up having to short arm it a little bit, but he kept his eyes on it. The concentration was there, and that just saved the run. He almost misplayed that ball by diving for it. He had an easier chance to catch that ball just running flat out and making the catch. Well, Ramirez has been known to do some interesting <laughs> things. Once you're in the air, though, what are you going to do? In the field and on the bases, he has his own unique approach <laughs> from time to time. You're right. On the, on the replay, it was clear he was taking it in close to yeah. his body. He didn't have to fully extend. No, absolutely not. That looks good. Tino Martinez. A ball and a strike to him. I guess when you're running after a ball like that, it may have been slicing away from him a little bit. We don't have the good angle on it. He may have thought it may take a dive to catch this ball, but it ended up being more of a routine catch for him had he not taken the dive. Normally when a left-hander gets out in front, that ball will hook. And that ball did not hook, and it's probably what fooled him. Two and one to Martinez, who walked his first time up. And they're making a conscious effort just to stay in tight on Tino. And you know, the book on him is you have to stay in tight. But if you let that ball move back out over the plate, he will hurt you. But in the first two at-bats, they concentrated solely on the inner half of the plate and off the plate inside. Upwards of 60 pitches, and we're only in the third. Over, doing heavy damage against enemy pitchers. They're roaring on the 2-2 pitch, which is lined to right for a base hit. Here comes Jeter, waved home by Randolph, and the Yankees reclaim the lead. And a real mistake there by Nagy. They had pitched him inside, so they had him set up to go away. You'll see Sandy Alomar Jr. sitting away on this pitch, and they throw, he throws the ball on the inner half of the plate, middle of the plate. Now, see where, see where Alomar Jr. is? Now, look where the pitch is. Back over the middle of the plate, not where they were asking for the ball, not where he wanted it. And when you get the ball down and out there, see how level he's, his swing is? He just has such a beautiful swing, and he just rips that ball in the right field. Ramirez had ideas of taking a shot at Jeter, but he was off on the pitch. As that ball was hit and Ramirez realizing he had no chance for Jeter, wisely held on. So Jeter walks, steals a base, and rides home on the RBI single from Tino Martinez. 2-1 New York. given up by Nagy. He walked the two walks that uh, he gave up to the leadoff men, first and third, both have scored. Two and one to the Yankee D.H. who struck out with the bases loaded in the first inning. had a couple of good pitches to hit both ABs there was another good fastball that uh, Cecil was a bit tardy on back in the opening inning he had a good fastball to hit and fouled it here again that was a uh, kind of a mistake by Nagy this ball is about knee high and right down the middle 
with that one off his front foot. Charles Nagy, at this rate, sees the sixth or seventh inning tonight. It'll be an upset. <laughs> Runner is off, a liner to Fernandez, and that'll do it. In the Yankee third. But a single run gives them a 2-1 lead. After fouling one down off his left foot, Cecil Fielder as the DH has the luxury of giving it some attention in the dugout with a bag of ice on that throbbing puppy. That's a knife ice for a picnic on his foot. <laughs> Omar Vizquel hitting ninth against David Wells against whom he is just one for 28 lifetime. Jim Gray reports from the Yankee dugout that there's no problem, at least at this point, with Fielder continuing. One and one. I always get a kick out of David Wells' uniform. I mean, he, he looks like he's got enough material in there for another guy. And that's the way he always looks. I mean, he's been that way forever. It's uh, kind of the kind of the Jackie Gleason look. <laughs> I'm telling you, Yuka, one of these days, bang, <laughs> zoom. The poor soul. <laughs> well, he wears number 33 because his idol, as most folks know, Uber Dead. Exactly. His <laughs> spell <laughs> pops one into the seats. Two and two. Now he idolized the babe, and you can't have number three when you wear a Yankee uniform, no. so he doubled it. Went to the mound one game this year wearing an old-style Yankee cap from the 1920s or 30s in tribute to Ruth, and they said, no, no, you're not allowed to do that. you got to wear the same hat as the rest of your teammates. Of course, there are no tattoo regulations, so sports one or two of those. There's the heavy rock music in the locker room. Vizquel tags this one. Despite his past history, he got a good piece of it and almost pins Reigns to the wall, but almost 370 feet away, he makes the catch. You know what Tony Perez would say about that? When a little guy hits it, it doesn't go out. But if a big guy hits it that good, it's in the upper deck. He hits this ball very well. I, mean, I thought it was gone, but you do not get the carry if you're not as strong as the big guys. You don't get to carry here to left field that you do to right either. It's 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 a lot more comfortable in right field. And David Wells says, mm -hmm. <laughs> "Thank you very much." Little guy hit it. So Fiscal, who's never had any success against Wells, came close that time. Biff Roberts, who grounded out his first time up, bottom of the third, one out, nobody on. Two one New York. that stare down with Yankee owner George Steinbrenner a few weeks ago where Steinbrenner was on his case during the stretch where Wells was very ineffective had some disparaging remarks to make in the Yankee locker room bounced to short it comes up for Jeter that takes care of Roberts to be continued because we must tell you now that you can follow the baseball postseason online at MLBWorldSeries.com check in and see our video play of the day that's what the page looks like today. You can log on for daily player chats with some of the biggest names in the game. Take part in a live vote on the topic of the day at MLBWorldSeries.com. So anyway, Wells says to Steinbrenner, hey, I had to pop you one. Steinbrenner says, come on, go ahead. Wells didn't take him up on it, which was probably yeah, that was the best thing. Change up. First one he's thrown in this ball game. 
Not that Wells hasn't been involved in a brawl or two. Oh, from yeah, time there's, to time. A, there's a time and place for everything. I mean, after the season's another time. <laughs> It didn't surprise me that George said, come on. Did it surprise you at all? I thought it was a good move. I did too. Very slim chance that Wells is going to take him up on it. Looks good on the resume. <laughs> did you ever challenge your owner to a fight? You I never saw an owner. Well, never saw an owner. Not when I played, I should say. <laughs> or not when I sat. Let me get it all straight here. Two to Seitzer. I was happy. I, I, I never had a problem with it. Give me just the uniform top. I didn't care. I wore jeans on it. <laughs> Hayes backs up. Does he have time? Somehow, yes. As deep as he was. Despite bobbling it, he gets Seitzer. And we're back after this from your local station. Because Seitzer doesn't run that well, then he knocks it down and watch. He bobbles it again, picks it up, and he still has time to get Seitzer. We might have to bet on Wilson Alvarez in a race <laughs> with Seitzer. I'll tell you what, as Hayes exchanges the glove for the bat now, after watching Alvarez run last night in San Francisco, yeah. I'm not betting against him, or on him, against Clydesdales. <laughs> Real one. Clydesdales. Oh, you're from St. Louis. You see them all the time, don't you? Clydesdales, that is, not Alvarez. If I saw Alvarez all the time, would I be saying that? Here's Hayes. Lining one to left, and this ball fools Bill Roberts. And he has to go airborne to pull it in. That ball was really smoked by Charlie Hayes. I mean, about halfway out there. Did you see that thing take off? He got underneath this ball. This is a line drive. He had a fastball. Really nailed it. And watch Roberts now. That ball really took off on him. He makes a heck of a catch. Woo! <laughs> ball really took off. It was really hit hard by Hayes. Heck of a play. <laughs> Charlie says, hey, I can't hit it any harder. <laughs> yeah, but he's yelling at Bip. He's probably saying, you know, you're a second baseman, not a left fielder. Team. And halfway out there, Biff thought he was a second baseman. <laughs> he not looked, a left up, he just looked up, he said, thank you very much. <laughs> One and two to Girardi. Well, Biff Roberts has played just about everywhere through the years. Still runs well, has some sting in his bat. Very valuable guy to have on the team. You know, Kaiser's doing a good job behind the plate tonight. He really is. I mean, he's, he's, he's been fair both ways. Pitches that are just off uh, their balls and those that are right on the corner. I mean, he's, he's, he's calling a good ball game. Greg Kosk is asked to rule once again, and he says no. The count is full. That's a redeemer for the Yankee bench there. There's that last breaking ball. Yep. He held. Good call. Another check swing by Girardi. Another walk. The fourth walk issued by Nagy, who has seen the count go full to seven. Of the 15 hitters he's faced. And there's Bip still trying to figure out what's going on. yelling at him in a second. <laughs> a look is enough. Up and into Sanchez for ball one. Two 
Two runs, two hits, no errors for New York. One, two, and one for Cleveland. And the error, a throwing error in the first, figured in the first Yankee run. There goes the runner. The ball bounded down toward third. Matt Williams has it. He throws Sanchez out at first, but Girardi's in scoring position with two out. Wednesday, the premiere of working. Very happy to be here, Mr. Deal. Call me Tim. Nobody around here pulls any power tricks. Have a seat in the little chair. So, Fred Savage premieres in working Wednesday on NBC. Hargrove is, uh, is coming out to talk with Charles Nagy. There's activity in the Indians' bullpen. Before this game ever got underway tonight, Nagy had, uh, had made his bullpen pitches and had warmed up. Came back to the Indian dugout, and then the game was delayed for a couple of minutes because Charles Nagy was up in the Indians' clubhouse. Evidently, something was wrong then, and uh, he may be having problems again now. Chad O.J. in the uh, Indian bullpen and Mike Hargrove evidently has gotten the right answer from Charles Nagy because he's going to stay and uh, Hargrove heading back to the dugout. Some people thought O.J. might have been Hargrove's choice as the game four starter, but he erased all doubt. No, he'll give the ball again to Oral Hershiser, opposed by Dwight Gooden, who was 3-0 with an ERA of just over two against Cleveland this year and is 5-0 lifetime versus the Indians. has walked, scored a run, and bounced to the mound. And O.J. is not sitting down. We may see him in the next inning. Maggie, I don't know if he's got something wrong with his side, Joe. He looked like he was uh, he was favoring his side a little bit, and uh, Marco decided to stay with him. As we said earlier, starting pitching really has been the area of the greatest fall-off. Maggie did win 15. But Mike Hargrove and John Hart were hopeful that they could sign Roger Clemens. They tried to get into that derby. It didn't work. They've used 14 different starting pitchers this year. And then when you look at the bullpen, although Jose Mesa has reclaimed the closer's role, he is not automatic as he was a couple of years ago. Far from it. Behind on the count, 2-0, oh, with first base open. They'll throw the next two wide and high to range. And take their chances with Derek Jeter, a right-handed hitter. Tim Raines has been swinging the bat very well, and they remember how well he hit the ball in last year's home season. I mean, he has been one of the Yankees' secret weapons in the postseason the last couple of years. Even though he's had problems during the year, he had a lot of injuries the last couple of years. So Jeter reached on an error. That was in the first. In the third, he walked, stole a base, and scored on the Tino Martinez single. Two out, two on. And ball one. Very, very wild here tonight. Five walks, including the intentional walk. But that's that's not a normal Charles Nagy performance. And and again, he may be bothered by a, by a sore uh, by a sore side. There's something wrong with him. Nagy has pitched in the last three postseasons for Cleveland, including the '95 World Series. Light bit of rain beginning to fall, and there was some rain in the forecast. We're in the fourth. One and two. Well, a couple of good breaking balls that time to Jeter down low and away. This one again, a curveball off the outside corner, and Jeter chasing. That's a good pitch right there. Down and away, bad pitch for Jeter. Good pitch for Charles Nagy. And that drizzle is now a pretty hard rain. Mm -hmm. It's starting to come down. Fans are, uh, matter of fact, heading for cover. Yeah, it only took a few seconds. Just a few drops fell, and then the skies opened up. Well, they said only a, only a vague chance of showers tonight. The remainder of the weekend here is supposed to be gorgeous, but uh, it is raining now. A 
another full count. go and the bases are now loaded again on the sixth walk given up tonight by Nagy and his evening is done six walks three of them in this inning he'll leave behind two to one the numbers and the expression on Charles Nagy's face tell the story he was ahead of Derek Jeter one and two and couldn't finish him off. That became the last of his six walks. And now Paul O'Neill will be the first man to face Chad O.J. with the bases loaded. Well, the Yankees left the bases loaded back in the opening inning when Nagy pitched out of it getting Fielder and Charlie Hayes. And here it's on here that we're talking during the commercial break that, that he's he's going to stay with Chad O.J. If indeed it was something uh, physically wrong with Charles Nagy, it would have given Hargrove the opportunity to bring in somebody else because O.J. was throwing, but he stayed with him. And here he is facing Paul O'Neill, the left-handed batter, who has singled home a run and fly to deep center. Yankees leading it 2-1. to one. As quickly as the rain came, it has now pretty much stopped. Wow, this is a big, you know, situation in this ball game, and I can't see why you wouldn't have a left-hander pitch to Paul O'Neill. They said here, you know, it can almost break open the game. One and one. When we talked to Hargrove, he said that O.J. would be his long man, and this is a long situation, but it's also a game-breaking situation here with a guy like Paul O'Neill who drove in over 100 runs and can hit the ball out of the ballpark. Base is juiced with two down, and O.J. falls behind two and one. The Yankees have only two hits, RBI singles by O'Neill and Martinez, but there have been Yankee base runners all over the place through the first four innings because of the six walks and the throwing error. Girardi at third. Reigns at second. Jeter at first. And the 2-1 pitch. Pretty good pitch that time by Chad Oji. A changeup down low. And O'Neill out in front of it a little bit. And hit this little roller foul. That's a good change of pace. Good area. Down low and inside, and O'Neill fouls it. I think the location was better than the speed because O'Neill had to try to keep it fair because it was off the plate inside. Breaking ball hit hard, but foul. That's a little different situation here. This is a slider inside so he can go ahead and hack at it. If this would have been a changeup, he'd try to keep it fair, but he just rips this one, and he barely hooks it foul down the first baseline. That's a breaking ball there, so you do not have to try to keep it fair, although he pulls it foul anyway. On the changeup, he slowed his bat speed to try to keep it fair. Another 2-2 pitch. Full count. There's the area where Kaiser has really been good tonight. I mean, those pitches that are borderline off the inside or outside corner. And again, both ways. I mean, he's done a good job. Really has. Paul O'Neill, very good eye at the plate. He does not swing at a lot of bad pitches. He usually makes sure that he gets a good pitch to hit. Girardi, Reigns, and Jeter will take off. Gets a little piece of it. The 
just looked like a change of pace on a 3-2 count. It is a change. That's what up. it is. And O'Neal out in front again a little bit, but he got a piece of it. We've seen this. I can say, John, aren't too many times you sit on 3-2 change -up. No. <laughs> We've seen a lot of this lately, though, Bob, where a pitcher makes a good pitch and a good hitter fouls it off, and then they do not make as good a pitch, and the hitter's been able to handle it. Good hitters do that. And this ball is hit well to center. Grissom goes back. This ball is carrying. Grand slam home run. So O'Neill, who hit the last of those back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back home runs in game one, hits the jackpot here in game three. To dead center field over the 405 side. And good hitters do that. I mean, he fought off a good pitch, and OJ doesn't make as good a pitch when he comes back. This is a changeup, but it's up. See, that's a much different pitch than the pitch he fouled off before. O'Neill just jacked the straightaway center field. That's just good hitting right there, and he knows all right away that he's got it. He knows right there. He's saying, get up, get up. Yep, he got it. There's manager Joe Torrey there, Popeye, Don Zimmer, and the rest of the Yankee bench. Mel Stottlemyre. David Wells right there, yes. 6-1 New York. OJ's 1-0 pitch to Bernie Williams. All big situations do not come late in the ballgame. A lot of times they come early in the ballgame. This one came early. And I really felt like this was a big at-bat in this ball game, and when you have a right-hander facing Paul O'Neill, I don't think that's to your advantage in this situation. And we pointed out he was 0 for 5 against Chad O.J., but I've also pointed out that five at-bats do not make a career against a, a player. Well, Nagy loaded the bases on three walks before departing. O.J. runs the count full to Paul O'Neill, and O'Neill takes him deep. A grand slam to make it 6-1. to one. I didn't think the pitch selection was all that bad. It was a bad zone that he threw it in. He threw him a good change up the pitch before, then threw the next one high, and O'Neill jumped all over. Well, it's very difficult to make a great pitch and follow it with another great pitch on a 3-2 count. Because your first thought is to throw a strike with it. Bernie Williams lost one to right center field. Grissom to the track on this one and takes it at the wall. Take it to commercial 6-1 New York. NBC's coverage of tonight's Division Series game is brought to you by Genuine Chevrolet, the cars more Americans trust. By Most Wanted, starring Keenan Ivory Wayans. By Canon Laser Color, its only competition is reality. And by Burger King, where you can get your burgers worth. Yankees trailed 6-1 to one, going to the bottom of the fourth at Yankee Stadium in game one. Rally to win. Indians trail 6-1 to one as they come up in the fourth here at Jacobs Field. Much different situation though, Bob, because at the beginning of a series, there's a lot of adrenaline flowing. You haven't settled into a game plan. This is the third game of the series. They have settled into how they're going to play, and it's very difficult to come back from a 6-1 to one lead against a good team. Early in the series, you might do that. You do not do that very often late in the series. David Wells, those last two fastballs starting to heat up a little bit here. He really threw that first one on Ramirez, tried to check his swing and couldn't. And that also helped David Wells. He feels much better about his situation out there with a five-run lead. He knows he just has to throw strikes with his good stuff. Ramirez followed by Williams and Justice, the heart of the Cleveland order in the fourth. Manny lined to third, his only time up in this game. Hit 328 for the year with 26 home runs.
another 0-2 pitch. Fastball shatters his bat. Hayes can't make the play, and Ramirez will reach on an error to open the fourth. And you could see that coming because he was going to get an in-between hop. You have to either stop short or charge it a little harder. Now watch, he goes across first. See, he's running away from the ball first instead of going towards it. Now he goes towards it, and he gets the in-between hop. And from up here, you could just see that he was going to get the in-between hop. You've got to start towards it early, or you've got to wait back. You can't get it on the big in-between hop. You've got to get it either on the short hop or the big hop. Williams, who singled his first time up. In the air to shallow center field, Williams coming in along with Paul O'Neill. They converge on it, and it's O'Neill who snatches it out of the air. <laughs> well, that's one, of those, that's one of those plays where O'Neill's got to give way. I mean, that center fielder is the captain out there. Paul O'Neill, though, has done that before in right center field with, with Bernie Williams. Either one makes the catch. Bernie Williams is the guy who's hollering, I got it, I got it, I got it. Oh, really, said Paul O'Neill. <laughs> Paul O'Neill's a little jacked up right now, too. I mean, let's face it, he just hit a grand slam. You know, he says, hey, it's my night, I'm going to take this. But you're right, the center fielder has the right of way, and he's the captain out there. And you see the surprised look on Bernie Williams' face there. Well, if he makes a catch like that in front of range, we'll know he's really jacked up. <laughs> Justice singled his first time up. It was Justice who delivered the killing blow against the Indians in the 1995 World Series at Fulton County Stadium. The home run that accounted for the only run in a 1-0 Game 6 series clinching win. pre-game comments that year he put a lot of pressure on himself you know discussing the inactivity of the fans and how they weren't into it but he went out and did his thing is that Paul Ossenmacher? Ossenmacher? Did he hit it off? Mm -hmm. No Jim Poole I think. Poole? Okay Jim Poole. Double Jeopardy will be next and then the lightning round. All left-handers look the same anyway. 2-0. Want to bet it all. It took me that long to think. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wells working very deliberately. And Justice slamming one to right. O'Neal to the wall for the catch. Well, this was a beautiful swing by Justice, but a good pitch from Wells. The ball is in on him a little bit. We talked about keeping the ball in on him, and this one tails in, and he gets him on the, on the handle. Watch this pitch. See, it comes in on him. He can't get to it, and he gets it toward the handle. He does not get enough of it to get it out. That one just didn't sound good. Well, he, he doesn't don't have that real good crack to it. When they get in your kitchen, it doesn't sound good. <laughs> yeah. ball been three more inches out over the plate it would be a six to three ball game Sandy Alomar Jr. who popped to second his first time up a season that included a 30 game hitting streak for Alomar an all-star game home run in his home park here at Jacobs Field a batting average that was over 350 for a good portion of the season and wound up at 324 with 21 home runs. Hayes goes the short way for the force with Sanchez covering. So Ramirez reaches on an error to start the inning, but nothing comes of it. Still 6 1 New York. Here's Paul O'Neill. As he gets to the Yankee dugout and Jose Cardinal now telling O'Neill 
that anything hit in that area belongs to Bernie Williams. He's, now, Bernie Williams, look, anything in that area, were you calling the ball? He said, yeah, I was calling it. Paul O'Neill said, look, I just hit a grand slam home run. Anything in that area is mine. Almost a collision there. There was a ball hit in right center field that Williams was making the call on, but uh, but Paul O'Neill, there's Bernie Williams. You see him saying, I got it, I got it, Paul O'Neill. No problem. And that one got Ken Kaiser. And the fans compassionately <laughs> can hear. Can he wave that ball? No problem. Bring on another one. Bring on another one to the former pro wrestler. Watch this. Ooh, that one got him in the arm. Ow, that one had a little bite on it. That's almost like a step over toe with a roll on top of it. <laughs> yeah, you got to prefer the sleeper hold to that. <laughs> one and two to Martinez who's walked and delivered an RBI single. Well, they continue to pound him inside. Every pitch except the one he singled to right field on has been pitched inside or off the plate inside. And there he's going back in there again. Williams scurried over there but had no chance. One and two. Paul O'Neill has five. Of the six runs driven in, Martinez has the other one. O'Neill with an RBI single and a grand slam. That didn't miss by much. Two and two. O'Neill was the first man O.J. faced after Nagy walked the bases loaded and was yanked in the fourth. And O'Neill took him over the center field fence for the grand slam. And now a full count to Martinez leading off in the fifth. The Yankees with six runs on just three hits. But five of the six Yankees who walked scored. Williams into foul ground for the first out. Another blimp shot, and providing it, the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes. Goodyear Blimps now in their fourth decade of live sports coverage, but I'm confused, because last night in San Francisco, they said that this marked the 72nd year that a Goodyear Blimp had flown over a major sports event. Now, by my calculations, that's more than four decades. I think there's some sort of blimp scandal here that needs to be investigated. Well, I never thought we'd get here this morning. <laughs> Long ride. You guys left ahead of us. And beat us here by a couple of hours. Nice, easy ride. Well, you, you know, when you try to take a dirigible across country on a short schedule, we had a real good win, buddy. One and one to Cecil Fielder. I know you want to ride in the gondola of that thing. Almost last year. Almost last year. We had it all set up, but uh, things happened. Couldn't get back to New York with the Orioles service. Broken bat roll of the third. Williams takes care of Fielder. The way I heard it, you were detained at security. <laughs> for several days. Two quick outs in the Yankee fifth. Fielder's now over three. And here's Hayes, who's hit the ball hard twice. He flied to Grissom in deep center. And then sent a wicked liner toward Robertson left, which Biff had to leap to catch. Still wearing something of a bemused expression. Well, he was trying to get Marquise Grissom's attention to let him know that he was guarding the line, that there's a lot of area between the two. Them. And he wants Marquise to know he's got a long way to go to <laughs> hit over that way. OJ's 2-0 pitch to Hayes. He's in there. Yeah, he wants to make sure that Marquise has the Paul O'Neill mentality. Come get anything you can get. 
breaking ball, hit foul. Relatively quiet at Jacobs Field. Some of the best fans in baseball can be found in Cleveland. They suffered through all those years. In an outdated ballpark with a terrible team that was literally never in contention. Forget about never winning, never even in contention for decades on end. And then things came together. A new park, a contending team. You can't find a seat to any of these games, not just the postseason, regular season. In fact, when they had interleague games in Pittsburgh, relatively close by, a good portion of the fans at the games in Pittsburgh were actually Cleveland fans who couldn't get seats here and made the drive to see their team play in Pittsburgh. 3-2 pitch. Here's a drive down the line and left. Nice and catch. Foul, a nice catch. By the guy in the front row. Mm -hmm. you, there he is. You got it. Look what he's got in the other hand. Didn't too. even spill his drink. <laughs> Apple cider. There's that last hooking drive. Watch this catch. No problemo, baby. This time he reaches for it, rolls it to Fernandez, and the Yankees go in order in the fifth. After four and a half, New York six, Cleveland one. There's Paul O'Neill. And this is why infielders say outfielders should pay to get in the ballpark. This is, he's out there practicing his swing. He's Either not worried there. about playing defense. <laughs> well, he knows one of the infielders will tell him where to throw the ball anyway, but. It's either that or Tai Chi, one of the two. <laughs> hey, you gotta like that guy, boy. You talk about a hard player, great guy. Great guy to get along with, always willing to talk. Had a good time with Paul O'Neill before the game today. Tony Fernandez will start it in the last half of the fifth. Indians trying to creep back in it. Martinez over near the railing, but it's in the seats. has been with Toronto, Detroit, Cincinnati, Baltimore, and now New York. He's pitched in postseason for all of them except Detroit. A 3-0 postseason record. Beat Cleveland in the divisional series for Baltimore last year and beat the Yankees in the LCS. One and two. The great thing about David Wells is that he eats up innings for you. I mean, that's really why the Yankees wanted him, along with the fact he pitched well against them in the past. But he's a guy that gives you a lot of innings. He's always healthy. I mean, he's ready to go to the corral for you all the time. Torrey with his trusted aide, Zimmer. Is that somebody in your hotel room? <laughs> 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 Another broken bat, Jeter retreats into shallow center field, and there's the first out. The battle for the National League pennant begins Tuesday night, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. The Marlins taking on the Braves in Atlanta. That's game one of the NLCS, Tuesday at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on NBC. That could be a good matchup there. Kevin Brown for the Florida Marlins and, of course, Greg Maddox for the Braves. That finds the hole, a base hit for Marquise Grissom. That's only the sixth hit in this game. Each team has three. Take away the six walks given up by the Indian staff. And the big home run by O'Neill, but other than that, pretty well pitched ball game as you look at Grissom drilling that ball past Charlie Hayes. So Grissom aboard with one out. And it brings up Omar Vizquel. One for 29 lifetime against David Wells. But the last time up, 
He sent Reigns almost to the wall and straight away left. hasn't walked anybody, hasn't struck anybody out. Leads 6-1 as he works with one out and one out on the fifth. become a power pitcher. I mean, when he can be a strikeout pitcher, and from time to time when he does need it, we talked about him earlier tonight, the fact that he'll back off a fastball once in a while, but every every other time, I mean, if he needs a punch out once in a while, he'll really try to hump up on it. And another throw over. Well, he doesn't have any K's in the scorebook tonight, but he had a 16 strikeout game earlier this year against Oakland. And fans, instead of putting the K out, which has become all the rage when a big strikeout pitcher is on the mound all around baseball, they hung drawings of beer mugs out over the railing instead of Ks for each strikeout. And as you might suspect, given his image, Wells was delighted. <laughs> now he comes to the plate. Long foul. Let's take a look at David Wells shoulder we talked about it early in the ball game see if he's still getting it there we talked about how he had to keep it down to be successful right there you see him come right over the top fastball a little moving fastball on the inside part of the plate so so far he's staying with you know behind the ball and his mechanics are very good the O2 pitch by Girardi. Remember the game Wells pitched? We were broadcasting it an afternoon at Yankee Stadium, game two of the American League Championship Series. He was in lots of trouble early in the third, fourth, fifth inning. You thought he was maybe one pitch from being out of there. And he was able to grit his way through and even that series for Baltimore. He was pitching for Baltimore against the Yankees that day. Well, Joe Torrey talked about him before the game tonight. He said, if you're talking about somebody who's durable and can suck up some innings and, I mean, throw pitches and still be right, it's him. A soft liner in the center beyond the lunging Sanchez. On his way to third is Grissom on a single by Vizquel. This is a very interesting pitch sequence in that Vizquel has not had a lot of success against David Wells. And he threw him a steady diet of changeup. And with two strikes, he throws him a changeup here. It's a changeup out of way, and he just flips it out there, and he gets a base hit. When you've been getting a guy out one way, the way you've been getting him out most of the, in your career, you might as well go after him. Good job here by Sanchez. He tried to get to it, not able to get there. And Marquis Grissom, with his speed, moves around to third base. Bip Roberts, who's grounded out twice. A pop-up. Sanchez back into shallow right field. O'Neal in behind him. And you just can't call Paul O'Neal off tonight. But you know, in, in, in respect to, uh, to Sanchez, Paul O'Neal's there, and if Paul O'Neal makes the call, it's his ball. The infielder's got to give way to him. He's right behind him. Not only that, it's an easier throw to keep Marquise Grissom from scoring. But you do see Sanchez calling, but an infielder is really not supposed to call. He's supposed to camp under it, make the catch, unless the outfielder calls him off. Can't even see if O'Neal is calling. Here he is. Calling. He's calling. Sanchez doesn't do anything, Joe, but stick his glove out. He doesn't say anything. And O'Neal's not looking for his glove. He's looking up at the ball. So that was not Paul's problem that time. No, that should have been his catch. 
Bit Roberts very upset that he didn't get the runner in from third with less than two outs. Now there are two down. Runners at first and third for Kevin Seitzer. Ramiro Mendoza in the Yankee bullpen. You know how important this ball game is to the Yankees. I mean, this is the, the, maybe the biggest game of the series for them simply because they do not have a David Cohn to come back. They're going to go with Dwight Gooden tomorrow, and they're not sure of you know, their staff. So this ball game is one that they have to win since they already have a 6-1 lead. So he'll pull out all stops, use everybody in that pin tonight. One and one. Well, the Yankee bullpen, outstanding, especially in the second half of the season. There's tomorrow night's starter, Dwight Gooden, along with Andy Pettit, who would work game five if it goes that far. The Yankee bullpen, through the first two games of this series, nine and two-thirds scoreless innings. David Cohn is out. If they make the LCS, he might be available. Toward the hole, Hayes dives to smother it from his knees. Sanchez stays on the bag and makes a good play at his end, and the Indians are denied. A couple of hits, but two are left. And after five, 6-1 New York. To be a good infielder, you have to have quick feet. You have to be moving when the ball's hit. Watch Charlie Hayes. He's moving. He's got some movement. You can't go from a dead stop and make a play like this. He has some movement. He comes up. He throws the second. He takes the short way. And he's able to retire the side. Although we know that he may have had time to get up and throw sights are out. And watch this play. See the movement? He's got some movement. And he's able to get over there and make the play. You saw him make a little false step toward the line, but that's getting on his right side so he can push off, as he did there. Chad O.J. still on the hill for the Indians. He threw the pitch that O'Neill launched over the center field fence for a grand slam home run that broke the game open. It was 2-1 to one when Nagy left. But Nagy had set the stage for what happened next by walking three. And then when O.J. went three and two to O'Neill, Paul connected. Throws the fastball past Girardi to begin the sixth with a strikeout. Players, three ex-cons working for the FBI. We're not cops. Not robbers. We're the good guys. Okay. <laughs> Players premieres in two weeks on NBC Friday. I hope their parole officers are watching. <laughs> Ray Sanchez has grounded out twice. You know, if you're going to recruit employees for a federal agency, I think the first thing you ought to do is search out people with a criminal record. <laughs> it's all new to me. <laughs> I know you'll be watching, though, you. <laughs> couple of Fridays from now. You got that right, baby. How many banks you held up? Nine. You're going to be a traffic cop. <laughs> Get to double figures and you're in the FBI. <laughs> Hit to short. It comes up for Vizquel. <laughs> Two down. that stuff now you don't want to walk out of this place tonight and I don't want to be arrested or you know <laughs> golf for laughs gang <laughs> I love your badge 714 I watch that show all the time at the very least a wiretap is guaranteed oh. in your case Jack Webb was my favorite I love that guy top of the order and reigns on the first pitch toward the line and left Biff Roberts over there and in fair territory he makes the catch O.J. works a quick six. It remains 6-1 New York. Jacobs Field has become one of the jewels of this city. A rejuvenated city, considering the circumstances of the 1970s and early 80s. the way at the Gund Arena where the Cavaliers play. Reba McIntyre entertaining tonight. Sold out. Sold out. So enough room for baseball fans and country and western fans left over. Mm -hmm. Manny 
Ramirez. First pitch swinging as we move to the bottom of the sixth. And it's Sanchez in shallow center. Charles Nagy threw 33 pitches in the first inning alone. That was David Wells' 56th pitch here into the sixth inning. And again, no strikeouts for Wells tonight. He's walked none. And uh, again, if you're not the big strikeout guy in a particular ball game, it's going to keep your pitch count down naturally. He hasn't even gone to a three ball count. I tell you, he doesn't even look like he's, he's, he's breaking a sweat tonight, Bob. Beautiful night here, though. Rain fell briefly, a couple of innings back. Just as quickly, it stopped. It's an official game now. Williams is one for two, and the count to him 0 and 1. The Indian lineup. Go ahead, you. I was going to say, 57 pitches for David Wells is, is, is nothing. As Joe said before the game, Joe Torrey, very durable, and, and he likes to stay. He, he's, a, he's a stayer. He likes to stay in the game. Could be working on a shutout, speaking of Wells. But for a close play at first on a potential double play ball with runners at first and third, and Tony Fernandez was ruled safe on the back end, and the run scored from third. Game four matchup. An interesting one. A few years ago, it would have been at the top of any pitching marquee. Dwight Gooden against Oral Hershiser. Back in 1988 in the NLCS, they were the respective aces. Gooden for the Mets, Hershiser for the Dodgers. Hershiser was in the midst of one of the great runs in pitching history. The end of the regular season, breaking Drysdale's consecutive scoreless innings record, then through the LCS and into the World Series against the A's. Hit wide of third. Hayes has no play. We talked earlier, Joe, about David Justice. What a great swing he has. Here's another guy, Matt Williams. I love to watch this guy hit. I mean, you watch the swing and then the follow through. I mean, every time it makes contact, watch this. He's got a great swing. He really does. Now, what he has is a slugger swing like Jim Tomey. They clear their hips to get the bat through. Jim Tomey not in the Cleveland lineup tonight because of his past inability to handle David Wells. And we saw Davey Johnson make some of those changes, take some of his top players out, and he beat Randy Johnson. Two and two. The Yankees with a run in the first. Cleveland tied it in the second. Yanks pushed another one across in the third to take a 2-1 lead, and the Paul O'Neill Grand Slam sent four across in the fourth, 6-1 New York. The Indians have actually out-hit them 4-3, but trail by five. Good pitch. Sanchez going back again. He's been busy on those pop-ups into shallow right and center, and he makes another play. When a guy's getting a lot of pop-ups like that, you know that he's making good pitches in under the hands, and these guys are shortening their arms trying to get to it, and they're not able to do it. That's how he's getting all these pop-ups. Watch this pitch. See, it's tailing, it's sailing in a little bit on Matt. He has to try to clear to get his hands through. Watch his hands. Watch how he has to pull his hands in a little bit to try to get to it, and that's how you get a lot of pop-ups. So Williams is now one for three. Justice is singled and fly to deep right. That's with the bases empty and two down. We mentioned that David Wells pitched against the Yankees for Baltimore in the American League Championship Series a year ago. In effect, although it wasn't a trade, it involved free agency. In effect, he was swapped for Jimmy Key. Key to the Orioles from the Yanks. Wells the other way. The Orioles and Yankees continue to battle atop the standings, and Peter Angelos and George Steinbrenner battle in the payroll department. If you're a left-handed hitter, as Jim told me, as you, David Wells is not any tougher on a left-hander than he is a right-hander because he comes straight over the top, and he doesn't have a real 
hard slider. He's pretty much a fastball and an overhand curveball. Everything coming at the top, you see this just as well from the left side as you would from the right side. You see how he clears himself? So he, to me, wouldn't be any more difficult from the left side than he is from the right side. He's difficult from the right-handers as well because he has good stuff. Here's his 2-1 pitch. Down and away. And it's the first time tonight that he's gone to three balls on any hitter. I'll tell you, that's a, that's a heck of a tribute to David Wells tonight. First time, three, three, balls, uh, three balls and a strike now. And, and again, he's been around there all night long on the get-go. Fastball hammered toward the gap in right center field. It gets down and goes to the wall for extra bases. Justice with at least a double, and considering the score and two outs, he's content with that. Good pitch by David Wells. Six to one, you make him hit the ball. You get this fastball out over the plate, Dave Justice hammers it again, but he's just such a good hitter. He could have popped this pitch up. So you have to make him swing the bat. This pitch by Wells to make him swing, just hitting there by Justice to find the gap. I mean, he is just a pure hitter. Jeff Passaro pitched a fine game, worked out of first inning trouble. The Orioles had the bases loaded against him, but he got out of that, and Passaro and the Mariners managed to stay alive. They now trail two games to one, and they'll have Randy Johnson on the mound tomorrow. 1-1 one -one pitch. A drive to left. And Tim Raines is there to make the catch. Got in on his fists a little bit. Reigns tucks it away. The Justice double goes to waste, and we're back after these messages from your local station. Complete it, 6-1. to one. They're three ex-cons, <laughs> and now they're working for the government. Oh, wait a minute. That's a different show on NBC. <laughs> Joe Morgan, Bob Eucher. Hey, Bob policemen Justice. all across America, we were only kidding, all of us. Okay, take a good look at us. We're on our way home. <laughs> and we're on our way to the top of the seventh. Jeter has reached on an error and walked twice. He'll be followed by O'Neill and Williams. Chad O.J. working some heavy innings here. He came out on the fourth. And surrendered the grand slam to O'Neill. Left field, Roberts over. Makes a skidding catch. Sometimes he does look like a second baseman out there in left field, doesn't he? <laughs> Now as O'Neill comes up, let's go back to what happened in the fourth inning. A walk to Girardi after a 2-0 count, then an intentional walk to Reigns. Jeter also was walked on a 3-2 pitch after being behind on the count, 1-2. and two. And then, bam, O'Neill hits the jackpot. It's the first postseason grand slam for a Yankee hitter since Joe Pepitone hit one with the bases loaded in Game 6 of the 1964 World Series off Gordon Richardson of the Cardinals. I was there. This is a weak pop into shallow center, and Vizquel tucks it away. You were there, you yeah, were. Yeah, member of the 64 Absolutely. Cardinals. Well, he got O'Neill out on the pitch that he was trying to make when he hit the grand slam, a change up down and away, and O'Neill off balance pops it up, and he's very upset. But O'Neill is always upset when he makes an out. He oh. figures he's supposed to bat a thousand. Yeah, he does. 
OJ since the Grand Slammer, though, has retired nine in a row. The only time tonight that O'Neill has not hit the ball hard. Williams is over for 3. Did the 64 cards vote you a full share, you? Yes, they did. Yes, they did, as a matter of fact. I never did cash that check. Just framed it, huh? Yes. No, it's not much. What was a full World Series share in 64? I think we got uh, 80, 8,300 or 8,600 dollars. That was that was uh, that was the winner's share, and uh, of course it's it's gone up quite a bit since then. <laughs> Excellent observation. <laughs> well, just ask. <laughs> Got to do as asked, buddy. What's the most money you ever made in baseball? You twenty. Honest, honestly. Yeah. I think uh, my, my biggest salary was 21,000 bucks, 21 grand. And 11 of that came from selling other players' equipment, so <laughs> 10, really. <laughs> the one-two pitch, before you ask me, I was just say I was lucky enough to stay around when they did start play, paying seven figures. I was just lucky enough to stay around that long. Well, you earned it, though, Joe. You really did. happy I didn't care you're right I mean just I really did minimum salary went up every year I got a raise who cares <laughs> plus you got the meal money absolutely and I still got it <laughs> right down to first and sights it retires Williams unassisted so after the slam OJ hasn't let anybody reach base NBC's coverage of tonight's division series game is brought to you by Best Western, Best Western, across the street from Ordinary, by Gatorade Thirst Quencher. You don't have to live thirsty. Life is a sport. Drink it up. By Discover Card, and by Nissan, who reminds you that life is a journey. Enjoy the ride. Now, and thanks again to Captain Chambers and his crew aboard the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes out of Pompano Beach, Florida. Shots over Cleveland tonight. David Wells with the 6-1 lead that has held up since the O'Neill Grand Slam in the fourth. Goes back to work in the last of the seventh. Facing his former Blue Jay teammate Tony Fernandez. On the first pitch, a pop-up to short. Jeter for the first out. Folks, join NBC tomorrow for NFL action. It's a doubleheader. It starts at noon Eastern with the NFL on NBC. Weish and Collinsworth, Gumbel and Rashad, and others. Then in game one, most of you will see Marcus Allen and the Chiefs taking on Dan Marino and the Dolphins. There's also Pittsburgh, Baltimore, and the Cincinnati Jacksonville game. Then in game two, Stan Humphreys and the Chargers go against Jeff George and the Raiders in the game most of you will see. But of course, check your local listings for the games in your area. logging some miles last weekend Jim Gray was in Spain for the Ryder Cup he joined us in Seattle for the start of our playoff coverage this ball was popped to the right side a chance for Sanchez and Marquise Grissom is history in the seventh two quick outs then he travels with us to Candlestick Park stops off on the way to do an interview with Jeff George Takes an overnight plane, arrives 7, 8 o'clock in the morning with us here in Cleveland, then turns around and goes back for the coverage of the Oakland-San Diego game tomorrow, and then will join us in Atlanta Tuesday night for the start of the NLCS. Well, he finally gets to go home. Just the frequent flyer miles. Mm -hmm. Ought to net him something. The scale to the plate. Zoom names, he'll stop following us. I tried. No, he's here. We're glad to have him. Where is he? He's downstairs. He was up here a couple of minutes ago. He's everywhere. This gal is lined to deep left and singled softly to center. 
Still time for some force play on the Indian bench, despite the 6-1 deficit. No point in being overly grim about it. They've been down before. Now Vizquel with a 3-0 count. had the best record in all of baseball in the second half. They went 48 and 29. Closed the regular season with five straight wins, then took the opener of this series. Although the Orioles led wire to wire, and although they won the season series head-to-head -head against the Yankees, and although the positions are flip-flopped from a year ago when the Yanks won the division and Baltimore was the wild card, they could be headed toward a rematch in the ALCS, and very few people would count the Yankees out. conclude the season winning 17 of 22 or perhaps you'd like to express it as eight of nine or the last five in a row either way they were hot very impressive now the three two pitch and another pop up one after another this time it's Martinez who goes into foul ground to grab it gave every infielder but Hayes a chance to clutch a pop in this inning still 6-1 New York well, the story of this game appears to have been written early with the wildness of Charles Nagy, normally a very fine control pitcher. The six walks he gave up, he left trailing two to one, handed Chad O.J. a bases loaded situation. Paul O'Neill cashed all the runners in with a grand slam. That made it six to one, and nothing has happened since. The Yankees only three hits in this game, Bob. Again, the six walks, leading six to one. The Indians have but five total of eight hits in this game. Foul back. 0 oh 2. All three hits produced runs, RBI singles for O'Neill and Martinez, and then the grand slam for Paul O'Neill. Torrey in between Zimmer and Girardi. they had been able to retain Tino Martinez but they made a decision given all the stars they had that they couldn't take the payroll to that level of course Paul Sorrento hit 31 home runs for them from the first base position primarily yeah, Sorrento has done a good job in talking with Luke Pinella about Martinez, who, as you said, they, they, they couldn't hold, and, and uh, in getting Paul Sorrento, who left the Indians and and, uh, and went to Seattle, he's done a good job. I mean, he's a, he's a solid first baseman. He's a, he's a guy who's durable for you. He plays hurt. He's got power. I'll tell you one thing. If Martinez doesn't start handling that inside fastball, all the scouting reports are going to say just stay in on him. Went outside that time. Two and two. Four out of every five pitches they've thrown him tonight have been inside corner or off the plate inside. They're back in there again. Breaking ball, hit into shallow center field. Grissom comes on. One out of the New York game. Especially with the expanded playoff format, it isn't necessarily how your entire season went. It's how you finish up the year, what kind of ball you're playing, what kind of shape your pitching is in. Now, the Yankees have problems in that regard because there are huge question marks surrounding David Cohn. But they do arrive at this point in the postseason playing about as well in general as anybody in baseball. And remember one thing, Bob, it's not the best team that always wins. It's the team that's playing the best. And, th and that's even magnified in postseason play. Well, just ask Bobby Cox about right. his terrific Atlanta Braves teams who have won one world championship when over the stretch they have been the best team in baseball. Earl 
Weaver went to three straight World Series with the Orioles, 69, 70, and 71. That's one of the great teams in modern history. They lost two of the three. Tony La Russa's powerhouse Oakland A's, 88, 89, 90, lost two of the three World Series. As Bobby Cox has said, it can be a crapshoot in the postseason. Anytime you play a short series, that can happen. So that's why you want to be playing your best baseball when you get to the postseason. And that's basically, we pointed out a second ago, the Yankees come into this series playing very good baseball, as you mentioned. Two and one to Cecil Fielder, who's 0 for 3 for the night. All the talk about McGuire and Griffey topping 50. McGuire for the second year in a row. Griffey hit 49 the year before. Walker 49 this year. Cecil Fielder had 51 home runs in 1990 for the Tigers. Out of play, three and two. Well, the one thing I'm noticing about him in this ball game, especially this is bad, he's not getting good extension on his swing. The one thing I remember about Cecil when he was hitting all those home runs, he always gets good extension. He had a pretty quick bat. He's not getting real good extension, and this is bad against OJ. Two pitches, sky to center. Grissom for the second out. And that puts another example. That's why that ball wasn't driven. He did not get any extension. Watch his left arm. You'll see his, his, his front arm will have to break down for him to get to the ball. He is not getting that extension that you like to get if you're a left hand, if you're a strong hitter. See his, how his right hand folds there? I mean, his left hand arm folds. Watch his left arm. It folds under here very quickly. That means his right hand is taking over. Right there, you can see that's why he doesn't drive the ball. The great hitters get great extension, and they drive that ball. He hit that on a good part of the bat, but he didn't have any drive to it. Chad O.J., meanwhile, has faced 13 hitters. He's retired 12 of them, but the first one hit a grand slam. So what he did subsequently been impressive in a sense, but perhaps irrelevant. The 0-2 moves him away. Yeah, he's only struck out one tonight. I mean, it's not, it's not that he's doing this stuff with power. He's finessing a little bit. Been a couple of balls that have been hit well against him, as a matter of fact, by Charlie Hayes. O.J. is still in there. I mean, he's just moving the ball around, pulling a string once in a while. Two and two. <laughs> See, that's an old catcher talking. He wants that pitch. <laughs> Until you hit. <laughs> he wants that pitch. You're right. I thought this was a fairly decent pitch. Well, it was decent. And framed nicely by Alomar, yeah, but he I, couldn't I coax the call out of Ken Kaiser. Now, he's done a good job. He's been that way all night tonight, talking about Kaiser. Another chance for Grissom. All three putouts in the inning for the Indian center fielder. 13 in a row set down by O.J. 6-1 New York. You wonder why David Wells looks so neat each and every time he goes out to the mound? Here it is right here. There you go. There he is. Look at him now. There he's. Everybody else out here, all these tailor-made pants and the shirts tucked in really neat. Look at David Wells. Certainly something for all you youngsters out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Bigger the better. Chad Curtis is on for defense in left field. A bit of a misadventure on a ball hit over his head in game two, but generally a very good defensive outfielder. Stanton is the left-hander. Nelson is the right-hander. It doesn't appear that they'll have to call on Rivera tonight. Wells falls behind Pip Roberts, 2-0. Down 6-1. The Indians are down to six outs in this one. Roberts is 0-3. Taking all the way, and there's a strike. Just a few weeks ago, David Wells publicly complained, Joe Torre has lost faith in me. 
He said, sure, I'd like to be in the rotation for the playoffs, but don't ask me. I don't know if I will be or not. Two and two. Well, it's interesting because he kind of won a battle between he and Dwight Gooden down the stretch to see who would be the third starter. But now it's irrelevant in that David Cohn will not be able to come back. So both he and Gooden will get starts in this series. Gooden tomorrow night in game four against Hershey. You know, Joe Torrey's done a, done a magnificent job this year again with the, with his pitching staff. And, and uh, he's had guys who have been out. And, and uh, there's always a, a little conflict, I guess, sometimes between manager and pitchers and starters. And I mean, it's it's a, it's a foregone conclusion with David Wells. I mean, he's been a couple of other places where he's had run-ins. I mean, they're nothing serious. Here he is tonight. He's pitching a heck of a ball game, and the Yankees lead six to one. What's to worry? And the count holds at two and two. You can also understand if you're Joe Torre and the guy goes 0 and 5, you know, in August and September, you, you I mean, you have to lose a little confidence in him. Well, Joe said it was just lack of location for him. It wasn't velocity. It wasn't his breaking ball. He said he just wasn't throwing strikes. That was plain and plain and in, plain and simple. A lot of interesting decisions regarding that Yankee pitching. Becky Arabo and Kenny Rogers, a lot of money invested in them. They're not even on the playoff roster, at least not for this series. Spank to left. Curtis gets a chance right away and charges in to make the play. A reminder, folks, about the NFL on NBC, the pregame show that starts at noon Eastern time. There are features on that program about Dan Marino, Pittsburgh's Cordell Stewart, and the Raiders' Tim Brown, the former Heisman Trophy winner. Greg Gumbel, Ahmad Rashad, Sam Weiss, Chris Collinsworth and company at noon Eastern and 9 Pacific before the kickoffs tomorrow on NBC, a doubleheader Sunday. Kevin Seitzer to the plate. Bluff Savant takes a strike. did especially on the road in the postseason last year was remarkable it's obviously their first away game of the 97 postseason leading 6-1 in the eighth Seitzer's 0 for 3 robbed of what could have been an RBI hit his last time up on a diving play at third by Charlie Hayes I'd wonder about that uh, that face guard that uh, Seitzer wears now while with the Brewers uh, on two occasions, he was hit in the face with fastballs and, uh, I mean, really crushed. And, you know, I, you talk about a lot of hitters and how tough they are, and you talk about them being gamers. This guy is one of the toughest that I've ever been around. I mean, after being hit the next day with a, I mean, a swollen eye and, and whatever else, bad bruises and everything else, he wanted to be in the lineup. He wanted to play. I got it. I got it. Coming back I with us, it doesn't quite make it, Joe. Come on. <laughs> I was ready for that one. <laughs> if they have a little arc to them, I don't mind making the kick. Line <laughs> drive that I have a problem with. Uh, one came whistling back into the booth last night in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. Uke valiantly tried to make the play. Yes, came I out did. Of it with a bruise on, badly on the bruised heel of his hand. hand. Badly bruised <laughs> hand. Look at this. This is not blood. That, that, oh, that's that's actually a red ink that I put on there to indicate blood <laughs> for the people at the hotel. <laughs> that is nasty looking. Thank you, Bobby. Occasions a lot of sympathy. And Seitzer keeps spoiling them. Uh, let's take a quick look back at how this series kind of starts to map, be mapped out for the remainder. Mike Hargrove wanted to use Chad O.J. as his long man. And the fact that Hershey is going tomorrow, and last time he did not make it through the fifth inning, O.J. was going to be his top long man. Now he's pitching five or six innings in this ball game. Girardi back for a look. And this one won't stay in for him. So an extended at bat for Kevin Seitzer. And the question is, when will he be available again, meaning O.J.? So he's using him tonight in this 6-1 to ball game, but he's, he's throwing. He's been in since the fourth inning. Righty and lefty up. 
just in case OJ does not work on it. David Wells has thrown five complete games this year. This ball is hit down the left field line and it'll make the seats. In this day and age, five complete games is a fairly high total for a season. You pay so much for a setup man and a closer that very often, even when your starter is pitching well enough to complete the game, or at least have a good chance to complete it, it's automatic that he's out of there by the eighth inning. Absolutely. Whole different, whole different era now. And, and it, it's, it's a little unsettling sometimes and upsetting to, uh, to starting pitchers, Bob. I know a couple of guys that... Uh, in, in watching uh, Milwaukee's games this year, a couple of times with pitchers into the ninth inning, uh, where they had comfortable leads and uh, and low pitch counts and what have you, uh, were taken out of the game. And, and uh, nothing against the manager at all. It's just to get the bullpen work. I mean, that's their job. To, the guy who's going to come in and work the ninth or, or a pitcher that needs work, you got to get him in there sometime. I think that's the other reason why complete games uh, are now kaput. Now Seitzer punches one into center. And finally, Bernie Williams retires him. Seitzer was approaching the Luke Appling or Richie Ashburn category for consecutive foul balls. And discussing those complete games, that's what makes the fact that Pedro Martinez of the Montreal Expos had 13 complete games, you know, such a, a great figure. I mean, he had 13 complete games. And when you consider his ERA and the opponent's batting average against him and the quality of the team he pitched for, despite a number of remarkable performances by pitchers in the National League this year, he has got to be the Cy Young Award winner, Pedro Martinez. He also had over 300 strikeouts, and you're right. The batting average was under 200, and his earned run average was under two. Does not get much better than that. Ramirez 0 for 3. Lined out, reached on an error, and popped out. tell you, David Wells has thrown a lot of good fastballs and there's been a lot of pop-ups and, and a lot of foul balls. I mean, pitches that are up or waist high in the strike zone as you look at the uh, the rain starting to come down once again. But uh, these Indian batters have been fighting off the fastball for, uh, for most of the night. He's done most of his good work with his number one pitch. hit hard. Hayes juggles it for a moment, but has time to gun it across the diamond to take care of Ramirez. A 1-2-3 ace for David Wells. An inning away from a Yankee win. CC's coverage of tonight's Division Series game is brought to you by Old Spice High Endurance Deodorant. For long-lasting odor protection, now you've got proof, not promises. By Wendy's new Fresh Stuff Heaters. If you haven't tried one, you will. By the new 1998 Toyota Corolla. My, my, how things have changed. Toyota every day. And by MCI. Is this a great time or what? As we return to Cleveland, a little dunk shot into right field off the bat of Joe Girardi ends the string of consecutive batters retired by Chad O.J. at 13. So he's given up a bloop and a blast. <laughs> Here's that last uh, little flare by Joe Girardi, a breaking ball. And Girardi just got enough to drop it between Ramirez and Tony Fernandez. They sit for Girardi. That old Bob Prince line. From yep. Former Pirate announcer, a bloop and a blast. And now Sanchez lays down a bunt. And OJ shovels it over to Fernandez, covering it first. Not a classic sacrifice situation, leading 6-1, but... The number nine hitter advances the runner into scoring position. And this is basically the way Joe Torrey played last year, not so much with a five-run lead, but he would play small ball a lot of times by bunting, hitting and running, and generally running the bases with aggressiveness. So not unusual for him to do this in this situation. Now Chad Curtis... A former Indian, as you know. This season pickup for the Yankees. 
and a terrific acquisition. It didn't seem at the time like a major deal, but what a factor he's been. With the loss of Strawberry and Reigns being out for extended time, he became the number one player out there in left field. This is his first at bat of the night since replacing Reigns for defense. Matt Williams, David Justice, and Sandy Alomar are the Cleveland hitters in the bottom of the ninth. One out, one on in the top half. Two and one. The Yankees have just four hits. Three singles and the O'Neill Grand Slam. At this score in this game at six to one, you'd, you'd figure there's got to be more hits than nine, but that's it. It's hard to short, and here's a bad base running play by Girardi as he gets caught between second and third and tagged out by Fernandez. Did he miss him? They're contending that somehow the tag was missed, at least the Yankees are, but Girardi exits and the out has been recorded. It did look like Fernandez missed him when Girardi hit the deck. But again, it's a it's a base running mistake by Girardi on a ball hit in front of him. Here's the chase by Fernandez. We can't actually see from that one. It looked like he missed him. Went right over the top of uh, Girardi. Takes he a did. swipe at him and looks he like he missed him. him. No argument from Girardi on this play. And, uh, and there again, you see it from another angle. And after the supposed attack, Fernandez would have flipped back to Vizquel at second. Girardi was too embarrassed to argue. <laughs> second night in a row we've seen that. And the second time it's been by a good veteran player. Girardi yeah. is a very good base runner. Yes, exactly. He's even hit second up in the lineup because he is a good base runner. That was a tougher play than the one we saw yesterday. The one yesterday was just a ground ball. Moises. In front of him, yes, and Moises Alou in front of him. This was at least a one hopper where if you're getting a good lead off, you may not be able to get back in time, but you definitely can't get caught off second base on a ground ball for shortstop. So Curtis now is the runner at first. for two with a pair of walks. Two runs scored and a stolen base. Now Mariano Rivera does get up. Throwing in the rain. Another chance for Vizquel. Backhands to Fernandez covering. Chad Curtis has had a couple of run-ins at second base, and we'll come back and talk about that because that was another one that might have raised some eyebrows. Fernandez looked at him as if to question what he did. We'll be right back. Bob mentioned there has been some history with Chad Curtis not sliding at second base. So watch his left elbow there. He kind of throws his left elbow out, and he rolls at the... At at Tony Fernandez. That's why Fernandez was upset and the fact that he has not been sliding on some of the ground balls that are... Matt Williams is the leadoff man as Joe Torre is going to let David Wells try to complete this game. Jeter makes the catch and Wells has now retired 12 of the last 13 men he's faced. And we're going to assume that things will go well for him from here and declare that tonight's Chevrolet player of the game is David Wells. No good disagreement from me. Nope. I think he's done a great job, what especially job. from a guy that didn't know that he was going to get this start until recently. It's raining hard enough now to stop the game if they weren't two outs away from its completion, but they'll try to get through it. Well, it's a, it's a heavy mist, and, uh, and a lot of the uh, Jacobs Fields folks are, uh, are taking a hike getting out of here, but... Uh, Takes nothing away from this ball game that David Wells has pitched. He will now be 4-0 in postseason in his career, unless the Indians should rally here. Hit hard down to first.
Martinez takes it himself, and Wells is one out away from a complete game. We were talking about the complete game becoming a relative rarity. Wells had five, and that's a fairly high figure these days. The entire Cleveland staff had four. You look at Wells, and I'm reminded of the line that the great writer from the Los Angeles Times, Jim Murray, once had about Craig Stadler, the golfer. The idol of every man who ever said, sure, I'll have the pie and make it a la mode. <laughs> you know, in an age when everybody's hitting the weights, everybody looks like they just walked in from a stint on Baywatch, mm -hmm. you gotta have a Mickey Lovich type guy around. Oh, he is. That he is. He's a lot of fun. He's a, he's a great guy to be around. He really is. Motorcycle, he's a motorcycle guy. He, he's everything. I mean, this, this guy is everything. He, Sometimes he gets himself into a into a bit of a jam sometimes. He did it with Cito Gaston, too, up in Toronto. But uh, you take the ball. And he finishes it with a strikeout. Girardi's going to have to tag Alomar. He set down 14 of the last 15 he faced. That may have been his only strikeout. It was. The last batter. The last batter, and he throws a breaking ball to Sandy Alomar Jr., and this is his only strikeout. He just pitched a magnificent game, let him put the ball in play. Great movement on his fastball. This is a breaking ball in the dirt. Sandy Alomar can't check, and that's his only strikeout. But what a way to finish the ball game. He did it with just great movement on his fastball most of the ball game and throwing strikes. Good job by Girardi, and you have to give Girardi a lot of credit for the way that he handled well tonight. The Yankee bench reacts. They've got a 2-1 lead, and they'll ask Dwight Gooden to send them to the American League Championship Series tomorrow night, but Oral Hirschheiser stands in his way. If there's a fifth game, young Jarrett Wright, who performed so well in game two, will take on Andy Pettit again. Let's go to Jim Gray. Thank you very much, Bob. Well, David, just complete control tonight. Basically a shutout if you if you get to call it first base. What was your what was the key tonight to, to your success in settling down so quickly? You know, I just trying to stay ahead of the hitters and, and trying to keep them off stride and uh, you know, just try not to let them get extended and, and basically I was staying in most of the night and uh, you know, just got them conscious in and, and eventually go away or you know, throw an off-speed pitch. But uh, you know, basically I had good control and, and good location. That was the key. But you know, you can't uh, overlook the defense. I had outstanding defense tonight. You know, you got to give Charlie the uh, the game uh, player of the game, and he just made some unbelievable plays. Him and him and Paul should share the, the honors right there. Let me ask you about this team on the road. You're now nine and zero in the postseason. If you go back from last season, why are you guys so comfortable away from Yankee Stadium? I don't know, man. We just we we play together. We know what we have to do out there, and you know, I think that uh, you know each individual gives 110 percent out there. And, you know, and we don't like to go and, uh, and get beat in other ballparks. Now we we stay uh, we stay as a team, we, and we, we group around, we do everything, and, and we just uh, we just try to go out there and play hard nosed baseball. You know, you know we play fundamental, and, and that's what you do on the road. They you, they uh, you know you play to win, and you, and you try to win every series that you can, and, and that's what we take it in. There. We take one game at a time and, and do our best. Now the team that has jumped out to the early leads in this series has come back to bite them. Did that concern you at all tonight when you got up six nothing, six to one? No, you know, I just I, I was focused and I just went out there and threw strikes. Basically, when you get a when you get a lead like that, you just got to try to go out there and, and and keep your team close, try to get out as fast as you can and throw strikes. And that's what I did. You know, I got in on some guys, cut the ball down, and and when I did, I got it up and they popped it up. So it just everything worked tonight. How concerned are you, David, with the pitching staff? without David Cohen going tomorrow and, and with Dwight Gooden coming in? Well, it, it's, a, it's a tremendous loss with Coney out, but, you know, he knows, uh, you know, he knows what it takes. Uh, he's been in that situation, and, you know, he's got all the faith in us, you know, and, and I think we just, we, uh, we go off his vibes, you know, and, and, and his, uh, his uh, charisma that he has. He comes in and talks to us and says, just go get him, man. Just do it for me, and, you know, and that's what we do. You know, Coney's a great guy. He's a team leader. And we, we focus on him when he's pitching as, as like he does with us. And, you know, and Doc's got a good uh, track record against these guys. So, we, you know, we're not worried at all. Congratulations to you, David. Thank Great you game. very much. Thank you. All right, let's send it back upstairs now to Bob Cassis.
It took David Wells just 103 pitches to finish it. And now we're finished for this evening from Cleveland. Join us Tuesday as the battle for the National League pennant resumes at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, the Marlins against the Atlanta Braves in game one of the NLCS. Tomorrow, join NBC for NFL action. It's a doubleheader, as we told you, beginning at noon Eastern time with the NFL on NBC. Then in game one, most of the country will see the Chiefs against the Dolphins. In the second half of the doubleheader, the majority of the nation gets the Chargers and the Raiders for perhaps regional action. Tonight, after your late local news, Friends star Matthew Perry hosts an all-new Saturday Night Live with British musical guests Oasis. You know, you a lot of people say they sound like the Beatles. Let's get back to the hotel, baby. <laughs> what about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? We'll stop there on tomorrow morning. They might keep it open late for you, buddy. Tomorrow morning. Coming up next on most of these NBC stations, it's Third Rock from the Sun. Is that true? That can't be true. Tonight, after your late local news, friend star Matthew Perry hosts an all-new Saturday Night Live with British musical guest Oasis. That's what it says here. Oh, I guess there is time for another half hour. Why should I doubt what it says here? Third Rock from the Sun. For Jim Gray, Joe Morgan, and Bob Euchre, I'm Bob Costas, evidently a confused man. This has been a presentation of NBC Sports, home of the 1997 World Series and Third Rock from the Sun.